Uh, excuse me, I'm Michael Myers. I may look like a troll doll, but I'm Michael Myers. I told you guys I had a surprise, right? This is your present. This is the room where, where David almost lived when he murdered those 14 people. You're amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you, do you have any like insider knowledge about the Megan Kim thing? Um, you guys know about the elevator ritual, right? No, I do not know about the elevator ritual. Look up the elevator ritual online, then rewatch the Megan Kim elevator footage. It'll get you closer to the truth. Okay, guys, looks like the Korean elevator game is indeed a big hoax. I knew it from the get-go. I need way more subscribers, guys. Come on. You've got to help me out here. Welcome, everyone, to Dead Talk Live, where today we are joined by my very special guest from the movie Followed, Matthew Solomon. Matthew, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing tonight? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. I'm just hanging out here with my new dog, Marcel, oh. and we're just... We're just relaxing and super glad to get to talk about the movie. That's awesome. That's an awesome dog. So the big question I have, all right? I, I was trying to figure this out. The IMDb has the release date for 2018. Was it a limited theatrical release as far as you know? No, so that was actually our festival release. Oh. That was the year that we won um, Best Horror Film at the Burbank International Film Festival. Congratulations, uh, by the way. You got nominated for Best Actor. Yes, I did. That was very cool. It was my first time getting nominated for any sort of professional award. So that was really exciting. Um, yeah. And so that was our big, big, I suppose, release. And then we did our actual theatrical release this summer. This summer. Okay. So it did. Now, was it, did it go straight to video on demand or was it actually released in theaters? No, it was technically a theatrical release. Uh, you know, we were supposed to release in April and then COVID happened. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was, you know, a hard thing to deal with waiting for a release for a few years to only have it taken away. Of course, there were much worse things going on in the world. Concerned with. Um, so we ended up actually releasing in drive through theaters. Wow. Uh, yeah. So my very first drive in theater experience was watching my own film, which was cool. <laughs> uh, cool. yeah. And so, and then I think that. We did, once the COVID cases were down, we did release in a few regular theaters as well around the country. But yeah, it was it was a theatrical release nationwide. So when did you guys actually film the movie? What year we did shot, you film it? We shot the movie in 2016. So this whole experience, and well, and I was cast well before that. So this whole experience spanned four or five years. Now, from what I hear, you guys were actually cast before the script was written. Is that accurate? That is true for me. Uh, Caitlin Udding, who played Nick, and uh, Tim Dreyer, who played Christopher. All three of us were cast before there was a script. They, what they did was they gave me a page-long synopsis of what they were going to write. And they said, can you just come in and improvise for like 10 minutes and just try a few things out? Um, and I guess that was enough. So when was Sam brought in? Sam was brought in only like two or three weeks before our shoot. Wow. Um, wow. they didn't have a, they didn't have an actress for Danny yet. And she, and actually Kelsey Griswold, who plays Jess, my fiance in the movie, were both reading for both roles. Okay. Uh, as well as some other actresses reading, but the two of them sort of, I mean, they stomped the competition, if I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that approach of getting cast and then getting the script written around you? Yeah, I loved it. It was great. I, um, I, I, I can only hope that that, get, that happens for me again in my life. Uh, you just, getting to see the whole creative process is really exciting. You get close with everybody. Um, you feel like the dialogue is more natural. Uh, yeah, I wish I could do that for every project, honestly. And what was really nice is that Todd Click, our writer, was was really sweet, and he he really was okay with us ad libbing and improvising a lot on set as well. Um, so that was I, I love movies that are qualified as like mumblecore, uh -huh. and you could almost say that about Followed uh, for for some of the scenes at least. Um, 
And so, yeah, uh, if I could do it like that for every project, I would. I, I, I'm sure it would be great. Is it easier for you where, you know, you're playing somebody who was written for your personality or playing somebody who is just completely the opposite? Basically, are you like you drop the mic or is there some part of Matthew that is like drop the mic? I, I would say the only similarity between the two of us is that I can absolutely be a snarky asshole. <laughs> um, I am not, in my opinion, nearly as uh, annoying as Mike is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I, I really felt like I was stepping outside of myself in a lot of ways to play Mike. And in a lot of ways, it was really just a different version of myself. Um which is why it was so fun to play that role. Uh, and it, it made it, I don't know if it was, was so much easier than it would be to ju step into a, a role that was pre-written, mm -hmm. but it definitely made me feel like I was allowed to experiment more for sure. Now, I mean, how did you guys, the main core, the cast core, how did you guys interact uh, with me? I didn't even know that Sam was brought in so late. Was she like, did you guys integrate her right away, welcome her and all that? It was, we um, have a text thread going between all of the sort of the core cast. We talk to Antoine, our director, regularly. Sam and I were truly texting and catching up about life today. Um, she has three dogs, and since I'm a new dog dad, she's been giving me a lot of advice. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, you know, like... We have a few cast members and also our director who all have had kids now, and we're all talking about that with each other. You know, we um we really had a great time. The other really fun thing about the shoot was that we were shooting in a real hotel for most of it, and they had an amazing bar downstairs. <laughs> so we would wrap on the nights that we wrapped around ten or eleven. We would go downstairs and have drinks, and it was it was great. How long did filming take from like the first shot to the end to the wrap? I think we did it all in. 12 days mm -hmm. with one day off in the middle. So it was six and six. Uh, you know, I, that, I've been hearing a lot of that recently where, you know, and you get, it doesn't matter. Uh, you get great movies. Uh, doesn't matter the length. If the writing. I will is... say one thing that does matter is that you just don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, uh, we recently had Sarah Paxton on who was in the innkeepers. She actually stayed at the hotel where they were filming. Is that how it worked out for you guys as well? Um, there was an option. To, so we shot in two different hotels, one of which you wouldn't have wanted to stay in overnight. <laughs> um, it was the accommodations were particularly nice. But there was the option to – we had an extra hotel room that we didn't really use for much except for exterior shots. Uh -huh. um, so I could have if I wanted to, but I was super lucky. I lived 15 minutes away from every shooting location. Uh, I, so I was very happy to go home at the end of the day. Um, but like the nicer hotel that we shot in, they catered our meals. Um, so it was kind of like vacation in a way. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, uh, in regards to the whole movie, okay, what do you think is the big underlying theme of the movie? Is it a man who is freaking out that he's about to be a dad and he has to find a way to support it? Or is it somebody who's just out for fame? Um, it's definitely more, I think, a criticism of people who are out for fame. Uh, don't sacrifice the people in your life. Don't, um, you know, uh, don't speak ill of other people's stories, yeah. which is what Mike yeah. literally yeah. profits off of. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of YouTubers out there who have done some unsavory things. Mm -hmm. So it was a commentary on that. For me, the main moral that I walked away with is, uh, listen to the people who are closest to you. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much for people who maybe are watching this and haven't seen the movie yet, but it, there are multiple times where Mike does just not listen to the people who are around oh, him. Absolutely. That is a mistake. That, yes. Yeah. It comes back yeah. to bite him in the butt. Now, uh, mental health, I think is great. It's addressed in this movie. Uh, throughout various parts of the of the movie was that done 
consciously by the writers, uh, like medications throughout the movie. There was talk about therapy between Mike and Chris when they were younger. In fact, you guys met, in a, the two characters met in a therapist office when they were kids. Was that consciously written into the script to sort of break the stigma of mental health in society today? Um, I think they sort of were doing that before people really like, – Todd put that in the script before people really started putting that in stories. Oh. Um, and I don't think that he was doing it super conscientiously, but he was coming from the attitude of like this is just a normal part of many people's lives. Um, and I also think that there is something to be said about people who are creative, people who are more um, – likely to sort of start telling their own stories, start their own video blogs, etc. People who are maybe more attracted to uh, horror and gore and stuff like that. Uh, having a background of, of mental health issues or just conflict or emotional trauma. Um, so I think it just made sense for the story. And what ended up happening was it ended up just being like, yes, People deal with these things in a very casual way that I think is actually really progressive and cool. It is cool. Uh, I, I really I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. Uh, it was very, it's something you don't see a lot, and I really enjoyed that. Now, is this your first footage film that you've ever done? Like found footage? Yeah, this is the first time I've ever done found footage. Now, how is that exactly? Now, you are in regular actors doing a regular movie. You're not supposed to acknowledge there's a camera there, okay? Now, followed, basically, you were filming uh, yourselves for the for the vlog and so on. What kind of experience is that? Did you actually, guys, did they give you the actual cameras that they were shooting the movie and say, this is what you're going to use when you're pointing at your face? How did that work out? There was, I think, one shot that I actually did on my own. Uh, now I didn't get a DP credit, which, <laughs> how uh, yeah, there was one shot that I actually hit record, shot it, cut it. There's like, it's the actually very first shot of me in the movie where I'm looking in the mirror uh -huh. and I like have the camera on my mounted on my shoulder. Yes. Um, the rest of the time we had one camera, we had one, uh, director of photography and then two guys who helped him out with camera work. And basically the way it works is you just step the actor out of place and put the camera guy in and then just talk directly to him. And we got very, very comfortable with him because uh, Nelson, who is, who is the director of photography, would literally be standing like right here. And I would basically have my arms around him talking to the other actor as he taped it. Yeah. It was we got very close. Yeah, I can um, tell. <laughs> super unusual shooting style. <laughs> Uh, but he was basically one of the actors. And, you know, what was great about him is that he was great at handling us when we were improvising and keeping up with us. Um, now, in terms of, like, direct-to-camera address, I love doing that because I, you know, am of the social media generation. We're all used to having cameras on us at all times. Exactly. Um, and I had an acting teacher who once said, if you are an actor and the camera actually disappears for you, it's actually not there in your mind – you're a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> the camera, yeah, like, I don't, I don't think any real actor out there is ever completely able to block out the fact that there's a camera next to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. you're just, you're, you're always aware that it's there and it's just really fun for it to be like an extra tool that you get to play with. I mean, you look at sitcoms like the office and parks and rec and they've made an entire like really wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, out, uh, art form out of direct address. Um, so it's really, I mean, it's ultimately just fun. It, it does. It sounds like a lot of fun. Now, when you got the role as a vlogger, how did you uh, prepare to get in the mentality? And honestly, you did not take it over the top. There are people like Mike, drop the mic out there. A lot of them, actually. What did you do to get into the mentality of Mike? Any kind of prep um, work, I, any kind of preparation? Did you research a lot of YouTube videos? Yeah, I really just, like, watched what people were doing. I watched anything from, like, PewDiePie to, like, makeup tutorials. Yeah. Just to kind of get a feel for what all of it was. And just to see how different people interacted with the camera. Because there are those 
uh, on camera personalities who just come in at a 20 and just go and go and go and go. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that there was no way that I would be able to do that for 12 days of shooting. <laughs> I would have not survived it. And it's also just not super relatable. No. Um, and what was also really fun is like the moments where you do see Mike actually just having a conversation, even though he's in the middle of shooting a vlog that he's very, very cognizant of. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I personally, when I watch the movie, I'm like, that guy is annoying, uh, charming, uh, and I can't stand him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that if I had come in with that YouTuber personality out of 10 the entire time, you, you wouldn't be able to get to the movie. That's true. Um, yeah. So, and there's something really, uh, I think, rewarding about watching the character who starts off, you're just kind of like, I just want to see this guy get what's coming to him because he's just a little too full of it. Mm -hmm. And he thinks he's a little too cool. And it's really fun to see him sort of break down and become honest and become real and has show a lot of real emotions. And we get to see that in the end. Now, Mike did not believe in the stuff that he was pushing out to his fans. He didn't believe in the supernatural. Uh, he even kind of disrespected horror movies. Do you think that when he actually got to the hotel, put a bigger target on him from the supernatural entities that were there besides the other stuff that, you know. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and I think that the character Christopher is literally that voice being like, hi, you are, what you're doing is irreverent and you're putting yourself in danger. Yeah. Even if you don't believe in this stuff, you're taking it too far. Um, yeah, he he. he uh, there was a giant red target right on his back after uh, the second he stepped foot into the hotel. Now, Matthew, okay, instead of Mike, would you put yourself in the belief of like Mike ghost don't exist, or more like Chris? Hey, you know what? You got to be careful. You don't know everything. Be careful what you do. Uh, you personally, yeah, um... uh, how do you feel about that? I'm hugely superstitious and hard pass on all things horror, all things gory, all things like <laughs> – I I'm not like a Christopher where I'm like a super religious spiritual person, but I'm absolutely like – somebody tells me that they want me to go to a haunted house. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to. Yeah. I don't want to. Uh, that's just not in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm with we you. actually – the cast and crew, because, you know, what's great about shooting this movie in Los Angeles is that L.A. has a huge history of horror. Mm -hmm. uh, we went on a ghost tour before we shot the movie. And I, anybody else from that um, production could tell you I was the biggest wuss there. I was so <laughs> freaked out the entire time. Uh, yeah, it, 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 which is what was so fun about playing Mike. So I was like, great, I get to pretend that I'm not scared right now. And that's nice. Um, I get to be somebody who's not terrified of all these things, even though in real life. I mean, I went and I bought, like, crystals to keep at home when we were shooting this movie. <laughs> Don't want to bring any bad juju back with you. Uh, no. no. I'm, a little, I'm a little ashamed of that at this point, but, you know. <laughs> uh, another thing that I really enjoyed about the movie is that it brought, uh, it showed real life uh crime like the drug dealing going on and then the tragedies of the homeless people on skid row as well as the supernatural why do you think it was so important to bring those two aspects together in a single film uh, it definitely was a great decision it added to the film it made it more realistic supernatural world and all the bad stuff that goes on there and then you've got the real world well you know the world that we physically see and all the bad stuff that's going on in there as well why do you think it was important to include both of those i think it's really important because i mean first of all it tracks sort of mike's character arc um but i think it's really important because you have this person who is spending all of this time exploring things that uh, you can't see and that kind of want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And why not instead use that energy, use your resources, use that time to focus on something that's really happening in the world in front of you that's actually really tragic. And why not um, tr try to make that a better situation for yeah. other people? Uh, 
And so, like, you even see Mike is constantly making snarky, rude, inappropriate jokes about things. And he makes some of those jokes towards the beginning of the movie about some of the homeless people he sees, Mm -hmm. which, you know, in that moment, I those were some lines that were hard for me to say. I was not a fan of that because it was just like, oh, God, I don't feel this way at all. I don't agree with these words. Um, But uh, it comes full circle at the end where it's like, well, I've spent so much time focusing on things that are not tangible and I've become traumatized by those things. Yeah. Why not focus on something that's real and take my and spend my time helping people? Um, so I think that that was a really nice juxtaposition in the film. And you're right. It did come full circle. Now, uh, a big part of the movie is the woman that disappeared in the elevator. Do you know if any part of that was inspired? Uh, because something very close to that happened in 2013 with a, with a woman laying... Uh, Elisa Lamb, where there was big elevator footage and she completely vanished off the face of the earth. Do you know if that inspired that or followed? That was very much a direct inspiration, okay. for sure. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the Hotel Cecil in downtown, I know all about that whole thing because I was also living close to the Hotel Cecil when it actually happened yeah. before I was even cast in the movie. That's part of what attracted me to the project so much in the first place was that I knew about the Cecil's history, so getting to do a movie about that was really cool. Um, it, Yeah, it very much like the elevator footage thing, that was all very much meant to be a direct parallel. And now there's a new docu-series on Netflix about um, the Hotel Cecil. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, I, I personally think that if you wanted to, you should watch that docu-series and then go watch Followed right after. Yeah. Because you just get to see where all of the sort of small inspirations come from. Yeah. Uh, that story about Elisa Lam is so just beyond nuts to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, truly one of the more mysterious and terrifying things that have happened in the last decade or two. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Now, the Cecil, wasn't that also, I don't know if you watch American Horror Story, but wasn't that the inspiration for the American Horror Story season uh, hotel? As for, Do you know? I mean, I think it yes, was. Yes, I believe it was the inspiration for it. I think in that docu-series I mentioned, they talk about that as well. Um, I haven't watched actually any of American <laughs> Horror Story. Oops. Uh, but yes, I do know that uh, the hotel season was based on the Cecil. Yeah, and uh, just to clarify, you guys did film at the Cecil. We tried to, but they wouldn't let us. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we filmed, so we filmed at two hotels, one of which was just a few blocks away from the Cecil. Why two different hotels? Uh, we, uh, you know, we just needed certain interior shots for the hotel rooms and then certain interior shots for the hallways, certain shots for the roof. You know, there were, uh, we, uh, we, you know, it's filmmaking. You have to mix and mash reality. Yeah. Um, you know, there were like indoor house locations we shot at, but the outside of the house was a completely different place. <laughs> that kind of thing. Gotcha. Now, when you're filming, obviously, I've asked this to many actors. Uh, you're there, the camera, you know it's all fake. But was there any scene that you shot that actually really scared you while shooting? Yeah, there were a few. I mean, the whole basement thing oh, God. was just terrifying for me. I hated doing that. That was bad. I mean, it ended up being very fun, but I mean... It, the thing about that basement is that we didn't touch it. It was already like that. <laughs> but so so they were just like, okay, Matthew, just go with the camera and just do it. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was like somebody's definitely died down here in real life. There's no question. I was um, I was so wondering. Yeah. I mean, what are mannequins doing in a hotel basement? What were the mannequins doing there? <laughs> Why? Did they, I yeah. I, I I don't think I want the answer to that question. To be honest. Uh. And then there's another scene that made it into the film that I improvised around, which was Fred the head falling off of sort of the shelf that he was yeah. on. That was not planned. That was not intentional. It and He had been up there for like two days and had not moved. Nobody had touched him. So for it to just kind of fall off when you're already sort of in a spooked mood, really just kind of put everybody so on. So that was <laughs> not rigged? It actually fell off of the rack? Yeah, it fell off and I heard it and I um, was like, well... I could ruin this opportunity and ask the camera guy what's going on, or I could just keep going. 
and make some stuff up. Wow. Maybe it will be. Wow. Who cool. knows? You guys may have actually caught a real paranormal phenomena for a movie on camera. <laughs> and then probably the worst <laughs> thing to me about shooting this project was the, the cow tongue. Oh, uh, was a cow tongue on the roof. Covered in real maggots. Oh. And, not, not my fave. <laughs> so I prepared some clips, short, that are not too much spoilers. So let's watch the first clip here. Okay, here we go, guys. Let's do it. Hello? Okay, dude. Too much wine. So, okay, now, when you watch the finished product, uh, did it freak you out at all, watching the finished product? I want to say, I wish I could say yes, but I was there for all of it. And there's nothing less scary than shooting a horror movie. Um, and, like, that, I love that scene uh, so much. Because that was one of those situations where when we were shooting it in person, I was like, this isn't going to work. There's oh, no way this is going to work. It doesn't look good at all. And then I saw it on camera, and I was like, "Oh my god, it works! Yeah. <laughs> it works so well!" Uh, and so, and then, like the the sound effect, I oof, makes my skin crawl. Um, but watching the movie when we saw it at the festival, I brought some friends with me, and I had one of my like lifelong friends next to me who does not like horror movies, mm -hmm. and she was sitting there covering her eyes, like cowering, and I was like. It, really it's that scary to you i don't i didn't realize it was going to be scary because <laughs> um, i was there for all of it exactly so. exactly oh man uh, i love that scene i had to make that the first one we showed what do you think was the big turning point for mike being a skeptic throughout the majority of the movie what made him really start saying hey there is something really wrong here what part of the movie did that pivot point happen I think that there's actually a more subtle and very specific moment mm -hmm. that at least for me kind of triggered it, which is like there's that scene where Mike is running from one hotel room to another to another one mm -hmm. on a different floor. Mm -hmm. and then he knocks on the door and, ends up back. and he realizes that he's back at his own room. Yeah. Uh, and I think that sort of uh, re like distortion of reality mind F moment really uh, – really was the moment where it started you know john savage is in this movie and john yep. savage has been he's great i love him i mean he's been in so much uh stuff uh i don't know if you ever watched any of the original halloween movies to me john savage was like the dr loomis donald pleasant's character in followed where he he added the uh the narrative that made it so uh scary what was it like working with john I, he was a great guy. I only got to be on set with him for the for one day, but he was like really sweet, super happy to be there. And and it's it's really cool to see such a seasoned professional come in for a project with a smaller budget who just like wants to help out and, you know, wants to make a really great project happen. Um so, you know, and he gave me some nice tips for uh, a green actor and uh, yeah he was he was a really nice guy to work with and they gave him so much dialogue yeah so much dialogue and he really handled it like a champ so it, yeah he was great to work with yeah him talking actually just made the movie that much more scarier yeah I do, you, do you think uh towards the end when mike is making his way in the basement and uh he does he hear the reveal that john is telling him on the phone I believe his character's name is Dr. Wallace. Uh, do you yeah, think, Wall, Wallace Fleischer. Yeah, Wallace. Do you think he hears it? Because it's very staticky, it's broken up, and he hangs up on him. About yeah, who... I think that Mike does hear it, but I don't think he processes it until much later. Okay, because we know later on he does know it. And uh, it was just, I was wondering if he actually heard him and say, you know, but he still continued on. At that point, when you've had the epiphany, you know that what's going on is real. What is the driving force that pushes Mike to go into that basement? You know, in, in my mind and the way that I sort of approached it, Mike's not really in control anymore at that point. Mm. I think that uh, especially when you're facing so much trauma, you go into survival mode and you sort of shut those things out. So I think it was partially that, partially the fact that, like, you know, the hotel kind of had its claws in him. Yeah. Uh, 
and he's lucky that he got out alive. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I want to play this next scene because I want to talk to you about this next scene. So let's go to the next scene. It's, it's confusing. Okay, I just... Things that other people find disgusting and, and, and terrifying... There's a disconnect. It doesn't affect me that way. I. It feels good for me to see those things, okay? And I know that sounds twisted, but that's just always how it's been. It's been. Okay, now when I was, saw that scene while watching the movie, I started questioning, is Mike a psychopath? Where he doesn't have emotions. Uh he de- he's not a psychopath. We find out later why he's, he feels that way. Uh, what did you think about that when you read that, when you acted it out? Did, uh, the, you know, a person who has psychopath tendency, did that cross your mind at all? You know, it did cross my mind, but in the sense that I knew the writer wanted the audience to question whether or not Mike was. I did. I definitely <laughs> questioned it at that point. Yeah, I'm super glad to hear that it worked that way. Because, uh, you know, there's 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 the whole masterminding theory in terms of Mike. Um, but for me, it was really like this is a, th- this is a person who uh, has really suppressed some stuff. And really and, and it was really fun to to express that and be like, I don't know why I am this way. And it's scary that I am this way, but I am this way. Yeah. And, yeah. and it scares you. It scares Mike. And maybe the vlog and mocking it is his way of dealing with it because he doesn't know how to deal with it any other way. Now, where I realized you weren't a psychopath is when the lady jumped out and you saw her and you said, this is different. This is, I'm not disconnected from this. What was the meaning you were trying to relate at that moment when you saw that a person you saw alive a couple of hours ago is now dead on the sidewalk floor? Yeah, uh, I think for Mike, it was the fact that there was a person who was potentially involved in his story. Yeah. This was a woman that he had talked to, I think, multiple times, Mm -hmm. at least once. Uh, It was once, yeah. Who he had interacted with, who who, who was part of the mystery and who was dead. And suddenly um, the wall, the sort of walls of death were closing in on him. It wasn't just something that he heard happening to people. It was something that he was witnessing instead. Yeah. Uh, And so that's, yeah, that's for him the moment where it's like, oh, danger. The danger of this is, is very real and very profound. Do you think it freaked him out because for the first time in his life, he sees something that does actually disturb him? Yeah, absolutely. Something, yeah, for it to actually have an impact is also very shocking. Okay. Now let's move on to Nick's character, okay? Uh, Nick is somebody who really don't get to know. She's a very mysterious character. Uh, she gets her own hotel room, aside from you guys, does the all the editing. Uh, was there a lot of stuff cut out? that explained deeper about her or was it meant to be a mystery? It was really meant to be a mystery. It was really meant to be like the editor who doesn't get, uh, you know, for, for film editors are basically responsible for the movie being good. Oh yeah, (laughs) it's true. Yeah. (laughs) And so it was very much like the editor who is responsible for making Mike, Mike is off on her own and it's actually getting the worst of this. And is the one who's who's deteriorating the most out of the entire crew, um, and she's the one who's spending the most time in the hotel alone, letting it sort of work its magic on her. Um, so that was very much sort of meant to be just an example of what happens to a person who's put in that situation. Now, throughout the movie, during the footage that you guys are, sh- are, are shooting, we see the staticky where your guys, and all of your guys' face at one point or another, get for a split second replaced by somebody else. And that happened with Nick. Was she getting uh, possessed? Was she getting controlled by one of those entities? Uh, I would say an emphatic yes. Yes. Although I don't know if the static was necessarily being possessed 
or if it was more being influenced. Influenced. Controlled. Sense. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, now, this is going to be a little spoiler, but I got to ask you this question. That little boy, is that the brother or you? The boy was the brother. Okay, that's what I thought. There was there was a little bit of a confusion. confusion. Uh, when I posted you were coming on, I got a very overwhelming response of people who recently saw this movie and really loved okay. it. And there was a confusion. Uh, it was mixed. Oh, that boy was Mike. And I'm like, no, when I was watching it, no, that's the brother. So I wanted to ask you that, and thank you for clearing that up. Now, um... What was your reaction when you read that plot twist? I'm trying to even remember what it was like uh, because... It is a great plot twist. We're seeing it, someone's yeah, life come super, full circle. Yeah, it really is. Um, when I read that, I, you know, I just had a lot of... I had even more respect for Todd than I had before when I read that. I was like, oh, duh. Of course this guy's fate is tied to this hotel. Of course his backstory is. You know, and there are so many little pieces here and there that all kind of get strung together by that one twist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then also the thing with the eyeball that comes after. It was so fun, too. Wow. I, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that part is really cool. So when you get your call, the call from your fiancé begging you to come home, just had that horrible nightmare... Again, uh, we sort of asked this before. He is like, no, I got to do this. Uh, for me, I felt the driving force at that point was he was freaking out as a soon-to-be dad and supporting his family. That At that moment, that's what made him hang up the, the video call and saying, I got to do this. I need that money. I am about to be a dad. Do you agree or disagree with that? You know, I actually disagree. I think that the pressure of being a dad suddenly, it came on super suddenly, and the timing of it was not great, considering all the things that were happening to him. Um, that pressure is huge, for mm -hmm. sure, and absolutely pushing it. But again, I think it's very much like there was a spiritual sort of indescribable need to just continue at that point because you know all of those all of those different reasons compounded whether it was needing the money whether it was making this promise about getting subscribers whether it was about becoming a more successful video blogger in reality a logical person can 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 face all of that and go i have different options than yeah. this yeah um a video blogger would be like, you know what? I can uh, uh, spin this story so that me leaving uh, actually makes the whole thing more popular because I would got too freaked out. And then everybody's gonna try to go to this haunted hotel that I'm talking. You know, there's so yeah. there were so many yeah. avenues yeah. for him to take, but he was so deep in it at that point that he couldn't see any other any other option. So you're you're saying you think he was being controlled either by yeah, an entity. I, I where it's like the reasons that he had in his mind to do it in the first place have become twisted and manipulated by sort of the darker influences of, of his situation. Yeah. I think if he was in his right mind, he would have left. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I could see it that way as well. And uh, I could see it also the other way too, as a dad freaking out at that moment. It's just, you don't, you're not thinking clearly. Uh, yeah. But that definitely was pushing him for a lot of it, definitely. Now, the end of the movie, for me, is a little bit confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. After we see what happens with Jess, uh, and then we see that new kid, uh, Kenny, who has a vlog of his own, and he goes up to Mike's house, who we see is taped off because of what happened. Uh, and then we see a face come up to the screen, and then the movie cuts. Is that you? You know, if Followed 2 ever does come out, which we hope it does, you will have to tune in and see. Okay, because I, I, I'm like, it could be, but it couldn't be, and it really had me questioning. It was a mm -hmm. little bit of a cliffhanger that's not clearly answered, and I'm like, man. Uh, now, 
what do you think the current state of social media and vlogging for me the the big point of the movie is to say hey guys uh the people out there that are willing to do anything for a subscriber or a follow it's not worth it it's not worth your life it's not worth the risks do you agree with that sentiment that it's saying hey there is a line that should never be crossed yes i completely agree with that um i think that you should i mean i don't think that you should sell your soul for any job no personally yeah uh, uh, because at the end of the day, your your career will stall or your career will come to an end or things will shift, the economy or the market for whatever you're doing will shift and then you're not left with anything else. Exactly. Uh, and you might, and you might, you might be super wealthy, which is awesome. Yeah. You know, yeah. blessing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you don't, you won't have much to fulfill you as a person. Uh, how did it feel having followed you being the main lead role go to theaters? I mean, you mentioned green earlier. You are fairly new. Uh, uh, not that new, but you're new to the scene. How did it feel getting your first leading role? I mean, it was, it was so exciting and it was so bizarre at the same time. When I found out that I was cast, I was like, great, this is one of those stories about an indie film where you shoot it and then it, you know, it does fine. And then you go to a festival, maybe if you're lucky, and that's kind of the end of it. Um, but hey, you got footage so that you can be cast in other stuff. Yeah. Um, I cannot thank Antoine Lay, our director, and Matt Brewbreaker, our main producer, enough for hustling. And pushing this movie truly as far as it could possibly go and getting it out into theaters. When they told me that we were actually having a theatrical release, I was like, no way. No way did this shoestring budget film with a bunch of new actors make it this far. That's wild. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was it was nothing short of just like really incredible and exciting. Well, uh, we were supposed to have a full-fledged premiere. We were supposed to have a red carpet. Unfortunately, the 2020 took away stuff from all of us. Yeah. <laughs> it did. But just having that happen in the first place, getting to you know talk about the movie, do these kinds of interviews, it's really it's really a, a blessing and a pleasure. My feeling is now that follow is available widely on video on demand, which is how I came across it. I think as time goes on, its popularity is going to increase and it's going to end up on one of those lists at the end of this year, like one of the biggest underrated movies that you didn't hear of possibly. I hugely appreciate that. And, you know, from from your lips to God's ears is all <laughs> I will say. I know. And I think that, you know, the the people out there who love horror movies are so passionate about this genre and they uh really are the reason that actors like me get to do what we do so anybody who watches it and enjoys it i'm just like i'm so thankful um i mean how do yeah. you feel doing a horror movie is it did you enjoy it more than you thought you would is it something you want to continue doing in the future you know i'd heard interviews and i'd heard other actors talk about how horror movies are one of the most fun things to shoot and that they're not scary when you're shooting it in the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was always like, I want to test that theory. I really want to find out for myself if that's true. Luckily, you know, one of my first big jobs I, I found out and uh, yeah, I would do, I would do 10 more horror movies. I had a blast shooting it. It's really fun. I mean, how many times in your life do you get to scream at the top of your lungs <laughs> as if you're being chased by a murderer? And hopefully it never happens for real, I know. but I, you know, I would love to do it many, many more times. Um, so yeah, it was, it was so fun and you just get to really let loose with the project like that. Did you find yourself after the movie gaining a new respect for the horror genre? Oh, 1 million percent. I'd watched uh, like a, a decent handful of horror movies. I'd watched the Scream franchise. I Rosemary's Baby was one of my favorite movies, mm -hmm. which is a bit more psychological than yeah. it is horror. Um, but then, you know, really sitting down and continuing to watch more horror movies and horror series as well. It was like, God, just knowing what I had to go through and all of the work that I put into it, 
the, I'm so impressed by all of the different. I finally watched The Ring for the first time, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm a little late to the game. But I was just watching it. And I was like, "This is so well done," mm-hmm. and everybody who's a part of it is so impressive. So, yeah, huge respect for it. So let's go back. Uh, when? How did you get into acting? How old were you? What really cemented it for you that this is what I want to do with my life? You know, I'm one of those classic stories where I, you know, my parents put me in like a theater camp when I was six. And I was like, oh, I got, uh, th- this is the thing. This is the thing that I like. I got to keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, I think I played a spider in some weird play with like six other kids. And it was so fun. And then I kept, you know, doing local theater, school theater. I think my mom took me to an open call locally in San Francisco for a Disney show at one point when I was like 11. They told me I was so attention deficit at the at the time that they explained to us how to do the audition and i walked into the audition room and i was like i don't know what to do <laughs> so <laughs> really did not get the part uh older matthew has a lot of advice for younger matthew in terms of acting oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and then there was a brief period where i was like oh it's not a really a feasible career path for me it doesn't make sense and then i just had this um really great acting teacher when i was in high school who just went you know, you don't – being a successful actor doesn't always look like being a movie star. Being a successful actor – there. think about all of the people that you see on screen who are in shows and in mm-hmm. movies and aren't necessarily Brad Pitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all working actors and they all have really fulfilling careers. And I was like, oh, I don't have to like grind and climb ladders in order to become this mm-hmm. famous person. I can actually just be an actor. Exactly. That's great. I mean – Getting some attention along the way is lovely and fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Any actor who tells you that's not true is lying. (laughs) Um, But for me, it's very much like I just want to be able to do some really great projects. And I really just want to be able to, you know, afford a comfortable place to live off of that. And, uh, yeah, so. That's great. I mean, you get to do what you love and you get paid for it. And. I actually addressed this with my viewers and in an article that I wrote that we, uh, people outside of Hollywood, have a notion that once you appear in a movie, you're automatically rich and famous. That's not the case. No, it's not the case. You guys, uh, any actor is out there doing a job, getting paid, and I guess at the end of the day, the best you can hope for is to make money. Uh, to live and you get to do what you love doing now COVID how has that you know it seems like with the timing of followed and not getting the attention it should have gotten and COVID hitting do you feel that stalled um, what followed could I mean I still think it's going to be but as time goes on, it's going to be one of those movies that gets more and more popular. How big of an effect did COVID play in that? You know, sadly, I do think that COVID played a pretty big effect in in the movie not getting the um, adoration I think it deserved. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, You know, we sort of had like one standout horror movie of that caliber, which was The Wretched, which good for them. They really touched it because they were the first ones to go, all right, we're doing drive-ins. Uh, and so they really kind of drummed up a lot of press with that. You know, if we'd been able to do our press tour, if we'd been able to do our theatrical release, I think it might have looked different. But, you know, we we were also technically – well, not technically. We just were num- the number one new movie in America for like three or four weeks, yeah. um, which is really great. And the fact that we can say that is amazing. And 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 frankly, that might not have happened if we hadn't released during COVID. And the um, – and the market hadn't thinned out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of like its popularity, I agree. I think it's only just it can it's just going to keep snowballing. And uh, you know, it's done as much good as as I kind of expected it to um, before we released. You know, this is one of those projects that keeps proving me wrong in mm-hmm. terms of my expectations. Uh, so you know, a year from now, I could be uh, dealing with all sorts of stuff for the movie that I did not expect. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I can't be disappointed though, because it still happened and it, we still got a theatrical release and, you know, we still got write-ups in variety and all these other places mm-hmm. telling us 
that we did a good job. You did. So one, at the end of the day, yeah. I can only be proud of it. absolutely be proud of it. Everybody wants to know what what happened to Fred the Head. That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm sure somebody from production just has him in their apartment or their house. <laughs> Probably Matt Brubaker has him in his house. Probably. That's a great I – I asked at one point if I was going to be able to take Fred the Head, but they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let you have him. Oh, that's <laughs> – uh, so there is, a, you know, even maybe a slim, but there is a possibility for a follow too. And the story continues on with another vlogger, and we get to see that person's path. That would be great. That would be great. That, that That's definitely – and, you know, I have Mike come back as, uh, well, we don't know the fate of Mike. That's the thing. We don't know at the end of yeah. the movie. We have no idea. Is he alive? Is he dead? What 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 happened? All I can tell you is that, A, I hope followed to, I know they're working on it. I hope it comes to fruition. I hope it gets out there. And um, I have threatened them multiple times if they don't put me in the script. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, now, uh, before we let you go, cause we are almost out of time. Um, well, two things, uh, if you were not, if you were not an actor, what would you, what do you see yourself doing? You know, I actually think that I would probably be a therapist, uh, which I know is a sort of a, a left field answer. Uh, there are a lot of of parallels between psychology and acting. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where I get most excited mm -hmm. about the craft. Um, yeah, I think I would be a therapist. I've also always been the, that friend who sort of gives advice, listens to my friend's problems. I'm, I, I'm always happy to sit down for two hours and talk something out with somebody. Uh, I, I think that that kind of would have ended up being my calling. Okay. I might have tried to go into like advertising or something, and that I would have ended up resenting it. Um, I'm like a, I'm like an emotions person. I'm a feelings person. Uh, I, I, I relate to people over that kind of stuff. I totally hear you. Now, last question before we got to go: What did you think of the ending of, of Followed? And if you could do anything different, having filmed the movie, watched the movie, what would you change? If anything. That's such a hard question. Well, would you leave it open-ended like it was? I would have definitely left it open-ended. I would have liked to see a little bit more on-screen dying, personally. I would have liked to... Uh, I would have liked for uh, us to really know what happens to uh danny and christopher exactly they... i would like to have seen that that's the one thing that i would have changed but i really like how it ended and i and oh also i, I would have reached i would reshoot the ending now because i'm a better actor than i was <laughs> <laughs> but you're right da uh chris danny they left you uh, at the hotel rightfully so you deserve to be left uh, you yes. know, they tried <laughs> yes. to bring you along. You were not having it. Uh, yeah. then you just mentioned them in your last, uh, vlog entry that they, you haven't heard from them. And you actually mentioned, Mike mentions that you just want to find out if they're okay. Uh, I believe that's what you mentioned. Cause you, I guess you don't know either what happened to them after they left. There's a whole story that could be told about the weird stuff that may have occurred after they left. Truly. That is my favorite thing about the ending is that like, it is that ominous sort of like, Oh, leaving the hotel might've done something to them. And in my opinion, not going with Danny and Christopher might've saved Mike's life. Ooh, that's yeah. That's a that... Or at least for 12 hours until, you know, he's back home. And <laughs> exactly. <know> exactly. <laughs> but no, I, I do really wish that we could have, seen seen that go down with the two of them that's that's absolutely true i have uh i i prepared some more clips let's watch this last clip where's this page oh what the fuck no way no way no 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 way no way no this can't be oh god who's there what the fuck? Who is that? 
see, that's some freaky shit right there. Yeah, like, that gave me chills. That, I haven't that, seen that. I haven't seen that since the movie came out this summer, and the, 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 it's way scarier watching it on your computer. I'm realizing it is. It's very scary, and I cut off. It, I on purpose cut off whose book that is. I didn't want to spoil it. Okay, but. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what his story is, man. That's also another open-ended thing. We don't know anything about him and his involvement besides that notebook. Anyway, guys, we tried to do this interview, and I think we did a good job uh, talking about the movie, but wetting everyone's appetite who hasn't watched it to go out and watch it. Matthew, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on our show for having me this has been a pleasure yeah it's been an absolute blast the hour just flew by guys thank you so much for tuning in any final thoughts you want to share um all i can say is that you know a lot of people worked really hard on this movie and i think it's a really fun watch so i hope everybody gets a chance to see it it's available on so many different streaming services mm -hmm. at this point i can't even name it um, and you know, uh, follow me on Instagram at that Matthew Solomon to see what I'm up to. Uh, I've got some projects in the works for once COVID has passed. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I've been talking about followed for the last week. So guys, absolutely watch it. You won't regret it. And I do know for a fact, if you're an Amazon prime subscriber, it's available with your subscription to Amazon prime. Matthew, thank you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, stay walking, guys. Good night.